Uh, my name's Kiralee de Polne. I work for the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. My question's for Helen and Katie, really, and it's two parts. The first is the data about the level of HIV testing in MSF projects. Is that just that MSF are doing, or does that include MOH testing within? It's the both. Um, it's, it's in the sites where MSF is. We're very much integrated in MOH settings, so we're working in primary healthcare centres that are MOH. Yeah. So that's my question as well, the second part of my question. Um, when I was working in a paediatric project with MSF in Sierra Leone, for example, on my nutrition ward, I was very pleased that I could test all the children, um, but so often MOH weren't there. And we were sort of, we, you know, we were encouraged by operations that it should be MOH testing. And when then our lab had to do it, it was quite overwhelming for the mental health team to, um, to do the counselling. And so then what would your suggestion be in terms of do you think it's worth just trying MSF trying to do all the testing themselves? Or, you know, how, you know, the reality is often if MOH aren't there, they're just not there. But then, then what can we do to increase testing? I mean, I think obviously every project's different in terms of, you know, relate, how the project's working, MSF staff versus MOH staff. I think, I think our point is where MSF is working, yeah, in a paediatric setting, children should have access to HIV testing and TB diagnosis. And you were very lucky, I'd say, in your Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone setting to be able to do it. But the reality is, yeah, that that's not happening in many, many of the places we're working. And I know um, with our pediatric uh, pediatric working group colleagues, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a great degree of frustration that that isn't still happening. Um, I think you know, MOH has limitations. We have limitations. We have to work together to see whether that's us putting in one or two extra dedicated people to do that. So be it. Um, but I think we have to to look at it in the context that there's a lot of kids with who are malnourished who are not getting better because they've got HIV or TB. If you can take the online question, please. Hello. Sorry, I have a question. I have two questions, if that's all right. Um, the first one is from um, Dr. Sakidis, the deputy editor of the Lancet Infectious Diseases, who asks um, MDR. Sorry, MDRTB treatment could involve new drugs, but is this likely to be affordable and what are the cost implications? And I guess that the question goes to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think that it's one of the big challenges in the TB world and in the HIV world, drugs are expensive. And I think that um, as MSF, we do have the responsibility to fight and to lobby and to show that these drugs are actually needed. And then we can bring down, we have the example of in the HIV world and the antiretrovirals that we can bring down prices. I think that this is a, an example that speaks on its own. Um, and my second question is from MSF India. Um, they're asking the panel, um, where do MSF see HIV in the world in the next five to 10 years? And what important steps will MSF take to reduce or lessen the effect of HIV? in the world, again. <laughs> uh, Helen, I think you are going to take that question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, OK, so the message is we're not done. Yeah, OK, so there's another. We've got, well, I don't know, Nathan will tell us, but around about 15 million on treatment. There's a, we're aiming, basically, with the 1990-90 targets to get another probably 15 million people on treatment. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, it's been one of the most successful public health interventions of the last decade. But I think um, there's a lot more still to be done. I think MSF still does have a role in that. Um, I think um, people still look to MSF, I think, in terms of our programmatic interventions, um, simplification interventions still. Um, so, so yeah, my message is we're, we're not quite done yet up here. <laughs> Another question, please. Bertie Squire from the School of Tropical Medicine, Liverpool. I was interested in the results of the MDR short course regimen implementation, but struck by the figures from Uzbekistan, which indicated that I think you had 299 MDR, but only 199 were, in, were actually enrolled. Could you say a little bit more about those who weren't enrolled and the reasons? Because I, I suspect that's all to do with second line drug exposure. and. As a consequence, can you say a little bit more about what you think that means for those patients in terms of their access to 
medicines and their costs incurred in, 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 in adhering to what must be much longer regimens. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, very relevant. I think that for the particular details on Uzbekistan, I actually would like to get Philippe Ducros responding to the question because, because these are two independent studies. He's the principal investigator. Is that okay? <laughs> very cheeky, Esther. Um, so, excellent questions. Um, with the, I think there's a couple of things we've learned from doing this study. One is, when we started the study, we weren't sure whether this would work for all patients, and we were particularly concerned with the initial results from the Bangladesh um, paper around failures in um, patients with ophloxus and resistance. Given high rates of second-line drug use in um, Uzbekistan and in the region, we had quite restrictive exclusion criteria, and therefore I think we were a bit too limited and cautious. I think the second thing we learned is when we started and when we uh, counselled patients for consent to go into this study or to take the regular international recognised treatment, there was many patients who actually said, well, actually, I don't want an experimental regimen. I want to at least take something that I know that works. And, and people who chose that, it changed over time. But I, I think that shows that um, we at least addressed uh, an issue that comes up in many trials around proper informed consent, and that's something we're still learning how to, how to do well. Um, to counsel about the risks for, for new treatments. Um, and I think the other thing to say is that, you know, while this regimen, the inter interim results look promising, I don't think this is the answer for all MDRTB. There's still a lot of cases um, where this is not going to work, and we also need to be looking for the new drugs and other solutions. For the patient costs, that's a long, uh, a long discussion, and maybe I can throw to Shona, who's done some separate research on adherence in MDR in Uzbekistan. <laughs> Shona, do you want to comment on that? On the adherence challenges with, so, um, yeah, so there was a qualitative study that was conducted in Uzbekistan last year looking specifically on adherence uh, to MDR-TB treatment. Um, and that found that while we know that side effects can, can be a challenge for patients and that all patients on MDRTB treatment experience side effects, there are a lot of techniques that can be taken that can really help mitigate the, the sort of extent to which people feel those side effects. And that's things like looking at, um, rather than focusing on the negative effects of, of treatment on the body, by using visualization, distractions from treatment, that patients actually felt that they experienced side effects less. Um, there were also, uh, I'm trying to remember now that I'm getting my head out of Swaziland. <laughs> There's a poster, yeah, so <laughs> catch me in the break and we can talk more about it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if I could add, I think that what really pays off and also learning from the HIV experience is the time that you invest with the patients and the psychosocial support team and how strong they are and how well they are addressing and working with the individual patient on making them understand the disease, the process, and what it needs to recover. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? There is a question, one question behind here, and then if you can just pass the uh, microphone on. So it's, it's Doris from MSF Austria Evaluation Unit. I have a question to Shona. Uh, I wanted to know what you're planning to do with uh, the problem you were mentioning uh, with the healthcare providers in, in the relationship with their patients because patients were complaining that, yeah, they were beaten uh, or abused kind of verbally abused. Verbally, in the yeah. Encounter. Not beaten up. Yes, hopefully. and I, you said you are planning to do some uh, training, but I, I think it's not only about training, but maybe also more on motivation and the question, how do we welcome our patients? Yeah. That they feel comfortable in the... No, yeah, completely. Thanks for raising that point. Um, and this is an ongoing challenge that we face because uh, we know that the, the challenge of practitioner-patient relationships can have a big impact on how much patients feel able to come forward and discuss their, their issues and so on and so forth. But we have done training on practitioners in the past. Um, also, I was just doing a study on, on linkage to HIV care in Swaziland, and we found too with that study that 
things like losing the form that, they was, that patients were supposed to bring with them to the clinic could prevent patients from feeling able to link because they were afraid that they'd be told off for losing their form. And that really highlights, actually, the, the extent of the impact that can have on patients' ability to access care. Um, so I think that's something we need to, to look at more closely and to think not only just saying that we need to train practitioners, but actually what exactly can we do to improve that, to improve that relationship? Because it has a big impact on patients, yeah. Next question. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. I'm Isabella Panunzi, vaccination referent for, from OCB. And my question goes to Katie, because I was very happy to see in the same slide the two words API and HIV, because usually we don't integrate the two things in our project. And then actually with Helen, we did a short survey in OCB HIV projects. And then our question was, do we vaccinate HIV positive children? And the answer was no. We don't look at, at it at all. So my question is looking at your result. Um, have your thought gone a bit further in the sense, do you also want to look about do, if we vaccinate the HIV positive children, the PMTCT program? So not just to test about HIV. Also because we work in contexts where we have a very low a API uptake. It's not just the HIV testing uptake that is low. So I would like to know if looking at your result, it, what you say, the next step is to try to integrate more and then to go more into the API program to test children, also to think about the other, the other part of it, so to vaccinate HIV-positive children. Um, I, I, I don't think I can actually comment on, on vaccinating the children um, because really what we, we were just looking at the, where the, pre the prevalence uh, results are. Um, but certainly we, we recommend that uh, testing in EPI settings would, would be a good move. Um, the results were um, slightly around the background prevalence data, so it, it, it's, a, it's a reasonable yield. Um, but in terms of vaccinating, I don't... Yeah, I mean, yes, Isabel, we know it's, it's kind of uh, chicken and egg. Of course, we want the uh, HIV positive kids or the exposed babies in the, coming to the PMTCT clinics. We want our clinicians to be aware, have they also completed EPI? It's an essential bit of the exposed baby follow-up. So I think the message is, yeah, we're trying to push. But I think what Katie really nicely demonstrated, that EPI is a captive audience for us to try and scale up testing. And in PMCT, what, what we want to do is we know some women who tested negative antenatally will seroconvert. So we want to catch them by testing them in when they bring their kids for EPI. The second thing is 10% of the women we start on antiretrovirals antenatally don't ever come back because the healthcare workers have shouted at them. That's, that's a fact. And healthcare workers say that about themselves. Like it's hysterical. They say, oh, our bad attitudes actually are one of the reasons <laughs> they don't come back when you do these exercises. And so by trying to catch the ones who were lost to follow up, EPI also is potentially a captive audience to re-catch the women who didn't come back because they, they at least will bring their kids for a vaccination despite the fact they won't come back to get their ARVs because the healthcare worker shouted at them for whatever reason. In fact, my question came from the answer Katie gave before saying that it's very difficult when we want to work with API and then this is the infrastructure yeah. and everything. So if we start working with that, it's an opportunity then to look also at the other side. Mm. It's just this. Thank you. I think with regards to catchment of uh, children in particular, and especially with the problem of uh, if you test a child positive, then you inadvertently kind of have tested the mother positive. I think what we have absolutely underused and what Kenya has done very nicely is to actually do family-centered approaches. So to go and use the ART, the patient on ART, as the index case, almost as we do for TB, where we say, OK, there is going to be clustering of HIV in this family. And we should not forget to invite the children back to say, have these children actually been tested, no matter how old they are? And and it is so often the case that actually somebody in the family is on treatment and still the child is undiagnosed. Any further questions? There is a question here, and then we are going to take the question in the back, please. You can just raise your hand so that the people with the microphone know where to put them. Yes, please. 
My question's for Helen. Um, I was just intrigued about what to do with the children uh, who are on NRTI regimens, because um, you seem to show, if I remember rightly, that 57% of them you could suppress at three months by doing enhanced inheritance counselling. But perhaps the downside is that when you did genotyping, they all had resistance, and therefore in the longer term you might end up with more resistance because you've only theoretically got two active drugs. So on a policy level, what do you think about that? Is it still a good idea to do enhanced adherence counselling in children in an RTI regimens, or should you just accept that they're taking a risk and switch them straight over? Yeah, that's a big debate we're, uh, we're having. It's not just the kids, it's, to be honest with you, it's the adults as well. Is anybody failing in an RTI? do we give them the chance to suppress? And I think there have been a couple of studies looking at the people who suppressed, and indeed, and many of them are going to have NNRTI resistance. Um, I think we're taking a very public health approach to this. When we talk about suppression, we're talking about to less than 1,000 anyway. So there's a compromise within that that we're taking. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I, for me, Daniel, I think it's a very public health approach to this. Um, should we be talking about genotyping all the first line failures as well as well potentially given a cheaper more accessible test that's maybe a maybe maybe a route to go but i think i think the public approach algorithm we have at the minute i think is um feasible to put in place and i think probably does does a good job for the majority thank you yes please okay hi uh, i'm megan msf canada um, this is a question for the entire panel. In the last month, HIV testing has been approved for over-the-counter purchase in the UK. Do you think this model of at-home testing could be applied in the developing world? So it's basically, I'm just going to repeat the question because I think it wasn't that clearly heard in front. So it's basically about um, oral self-testing the, um, and which has been approved in the, or is FDA approved anyway, and has been approved for the UK. So is that a, an option? Is that a possibility for the settings you're working in? I don't know who wants to take this question. Helen? So, so, um, definitely. It's already being uh, <laughs> piloted in a number of the countries that we're, we're working. Um, different kind of models of using it. Some, um, some places are using it at facility level just to try and scale up uh, the access to PITC in terms of human resources. Um, a number of countries using it at community level, often um, through community health workers. I think the really important thing that's come up is the issue of linkage. Mm -hmm. yeah? What information is given with that test kit in terms of what do I do if I do test positive? But definitely, uh, well, community-based testing, so going to people's homes to test, is something that many countries are looking at and rolling out. Um, and self-testing definitely also is, is coming on the agenda. Mm. Yeah. And if I can just add on to that, um, we also want to include some qualitative research on that, partly because uh, rates of linkage, you know, reporting mm. rates of linkage can be difficult, as Helen just mentioned, but also to make sure that we're understanding uh, clients' views, and we know that acceptance and how you process a HIV-positive result are really, really important for how you then access care and also how you're then retained in care. Uh, so, so thinking about how individuals experience that, how they view it, what information they need in order to be prepared for if the result is positive and to make sure that they know, you know where they go if they need extra support and so on and so forth, yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, please, in front here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kieran from MSF UK. Um, it's a question to uh, maybe the whole panel, including Catherine, and it's about uh, health practitioner barriers to pediatric testing. Um, I think that's it, this was described quite well in some of the presentations that uh, uh, in, in many of the settings we work, uh, health practitioners will find it, find it very difficult to test uh, a child if they are not accompanied by their normal caregiver, and uh, sometimes this raises legal and political issues. If I can give the example from Swaziland, we did try to work with the Ministry of Health there, and the art director came and spoke to all the nurses in the region to say, we, sh we strongly encourage you to test uh, the, a child, even if they're not with their normal caregiver, in the best interest of the child. We will support you on this. Uh, you will have the Ministry of Health's uh, backing if there are any problems. Mm -hmm. And it didn't change anything. Uh, we continued, you know, when we talked to the, the staff and to, you know, tried to find out why, and uh, 
the, the, the health practitioners are from the community. Right? They, they, they still have to face the people, mm. um, the, the, the parents, when, uh, when the, the child goes home with their caregiver with an with a HIV positive result. And so it, it didn't, you know, this reassurance from the Ministry of Health didn't change anything from, for them. So uh, I'm just interested to ask uh, if, if, if there are any ideas or, or if, to your knowledge, any evidence of, uh, of things we can do. Right, Catherine, you said that you, you, you got very good results uh, in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, and how did you do that? And are you aware of any other, any other things we can do to sort of try and address that, that barrier for the people that are really having to live with uh, the, the results of testing a child without parental consent? So I have to say from the Zimbabwe experience, so we have, at that point, it was also very much a, a kind of Ministry of Health and City House mm -hmm. um, initiative. So we got City House on board, and they essentially were part of the workshop. And subsequently, due to the results of this very initial kind of um, research piece, actually the testing guidelines for adolescents in Zimbabwe have changed. Mm -hmm. And really, it wasn't that. Mu it isn't that much in Zimbabwe. The situation wasn't that much about um, there is a mother or a father available. That mother or father might not have even been there. And even so, the grandmother came with the child. They would still not test the child, even if they knew that the mother was actually working in South Africa or was dead or was quite far away. And if you look at the, the amount of pos uh, the prevalence we found, we found 5% um, positive children. Now we, have, we had initially four months where we had kind of a relatively lowish uptake of 70% of provider-initiated testing. And part of that was 20% weren't offered the test. And then within the ones who were offered testing, again, a high percentage, high, 20% didn't test. Once we actually ruled out roots, so routine opt-out testing, with a, with a big push also to clarify what a guardian is and that it doesn't have to be a legal guardian. So it's not that the healthcare worker does it in the best interest of the child. They still get the consent from the person accompanying the child. So it's, you know, it's not that the person who is actually caring for the child hasn't consented. So we, we haven't overruled the guardian's decision, it was much more about, do you accept this person as being the guardian of the child? And that has clarified a lot for, for the counselors. The other thing was also we then staffed each of these clinics with one additional counselor. Not that that counselor was particularly specifically trained on children or adolescents, but it just meant that there was a bit more time, and we made sure from an operational point of view that there was no running out of test kits. And so from a logistical point of view, there was no reason anymore not to test children. And then in addition, I think the, the, the big issue was also that all of a sudden, because everybody was offered testing, People didn't refuse, you know, it wasn't that much a refusal anymore. And if you look, and we have managed to sustain these 95% uptake rates over 16 months following just a two-week intervention without any retraining or anything. And we managed to get much more guardians actually tested. So because any child, in, in initially there was also a lot of confusion about if we test the child, the guardian must test as well. So we kind of completely unlinked that, but still that meant that we got a lot, of, um, a lot more guardians tested. So and to just add into that, um, of, our, of our secondary outcomes, um, we found um, 10 of the 15 studies reporting secondary outcomes noted an acceptance rate. And we used a proxy where acceptance, re acceptance rates by caregivers weren't available of refusal to test. We found an acceptance rate of 90.8%. So acceptability among caregivers is extremely high. Um, and so that should be uh, underpinning uh, our approaches as to how to to increase the, co the confidence and the comfortability levels um, of healthcare workers to offer those tests. So thank you very much for my all-female panel. <laughs> and I think we have, un uh, we have overrun a tiny bit by five minutes, but we started a bit late. Thank you for a very interesting discussion, and I hand over to Philippe. I'm embarrassed because our Indian colleagues actually have switched back to their own session. They're keeping to time. I mean, it feels like a race, like we're falling behind. 
and, and maybe that's just a reminder that the issues that we're talking about are incredibly urgent and we do need to see how we can get better treatment and, and take this research into our programs and into policy for better practice. So um, thank you all. Please enjoy the break. Be back on time, seated by 10.50.